Well, I have a question for you right out of the gate this morning, uh, something for you to consider for a moment. When was the last time you were really angry? Not just like mildly irritated, okay? Uh, Because that might be right now. I'm not talking about that. Uh, I'm just talking about when was the last time you were really angry? angry. Uh, take a moment. Maybe it, maybe it doesn't take a moment uh, for you. Uh, so, oh, so, you okay? You all right? Okay. Oh, that's good. I'm glad you're okay. Whew. Scare me, dude. <laughs> I'm glad you're okay. Uh, so, okay. Uh, when was the last time you were really angry? For some of you, that's like a calendar question. You know, it's like, what day, what week, what month was that? For others of you, that's a watch question. Like, you know, what time was it when Joel asked us to stand up and greet somebody around us? That, that, you know, that really ticked me off or, you know, when, whatever. So um, if by chance, if by chance you can't think of a time that you were really, really angry, then you get a pass this morning, okay? So you can just do whatever, just uh, scroll whatever you scroll, Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever it is. But, but be warned if, if that's what you do because... Social media makes a lot of people angry. So, uh, because there's just a lot of angry people out there. So, and then if that happens, you'll have to listen to me. So, uh, so be careful. But I, I asked, I asked Google uh, the other day, "Are Americans getting angrier?" Because it just seems like we are, doesn't it? Um, it just, it just kind of feels that way. That was my hunch. And so I asked, um, and Google did not disappoint. Uh, it, it offered numerous pieces of evidence that supported my hunch, my hypothesis. Let me read a, a couple of them for you. Uh, this was from a CBS affiliate in Boston. They said, according to a poll taken just before the pandemic, and I'm sure it didn't get any better after or during the pandemic, but just before the pandemic, 84% of people think Americans are angrier than a generation before. And, and 42% admi- admitted that they themselves were angrier but then they asked, but, but what, what makes us angry? They said, we asked online and logged more than 200 responses. Money was number one with 32 responses mentioning the cost of living, the gap between the haves and the have-nots. There were 30 votes for lousy politicians and a broken political system. That's because Thursday night had not happened yet. Otherwise, there would have been more, uh, but just 30. 23 blamed social media. See, that's what I was talking about if you, if you spend your time there. Uh, and 14 mentioned being overworked and underpaid. There were also votes for COVID, bad weather, traffic, and media. And everyone said, amen, right? Yeah, I mean, all of the above, right? Uh, then I found this article. Uh, came out of Indianapolis, Vanessa Enos. Uh, A licensed mental health counselor said anger is a response. Anger is a response, and it's often the result of something else going on inside of us that's much deeper. In many cases, she said it's worth, uh, or excuse me, it's worse when our basic life needs aren't being met, like safety and security. And when I read that, I just thought, hmm, hmm. Maybe we ought to do like a sermon series on the deep, deep needs of the human heart and how God can uh, meet those deepest needs. And then I thought, oh, we just did that. So um, she continues, we're, we're afraid. Look at this. We're afraid to look at our anger. If I slow down and look at why I'm really angry, I might have to address the fact that maybe it's because I'm anxious or sad or feel shame, or guilt about something. But we don't do that because we might have to do some work and change. And then Vanessa says, it's hard to go internal and do more of that work, but if we're going to change how we are, or how we act externally, we have to look at what we're doing internally. I think Vanessa might be onto something. Um, actually, what a, what a perfect segue 
into what we're learning from Jesus in this series that we're calling the good, actually scratch that, the even better life. The, the first book in the New Testament, the gospel according to Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 contain what we commonly refer to as the Sermon on the Mount, right? Uh, because it's, it was a day that Jesus was on a hillside in Galilee and, and he was teaching his disciples and the crowd gathered and he was teaching the crowd and thus the name Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Hillside. Um, and, and within that Sermon on the Mount, there's a section that Bible scholars refer to as the six antitheses. And the word antitheses is the plural form of the word antithesis, um, which means a contrast or opposition between two things, a contrast or opposition between two things. And in this passage, within the Sermon on the Mount, six times, six times Jesus draws a contrast or he sets two things in opposition to each other by saying, you have heard it said, but I say to you, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Now, before Jesus dives into these six antitheses recorded in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and following, he uses a really, really, really important word in verse 20. Um, it's usually translated righteousness in our Bible. Um, but the Greek word that's behind it, the, the earliest manuscripts of the of the New Testament were written in the ancient Greek language. And, and so what we have are translations from that, uh, those early Greek manuscripts. But uh, the Greek word behind it is a super, super significant word. And it's a, it's a word about which, you know, volumes have been written and theological reflections. But, but perhaps the best understanding of it, if you just boil it down, is up true inner goodness. True inner goodness. Um, the kind that's found most fully, most completely in the person of God himself. True inner goodness. And, and, and the kind that's expressed most clearly in the person of Christ Jesus. And the Bible teaches us that this life of true inner goodness is the truly human life. This is so important to understand. This life of true inner goodness is the truly human life that God originally designed before sin entered the human story and train wrecked things. <laughs> but this life of true inner goodness is, is God's original design and it's still God's intention for us. It's what he's working to restore in us. <laughs> and Jesus came... To do that work of restoration, he came, he came first of all as a model of what this true inner goodness looks like, what this truly human life is supposed to look like. But he didn't just come as a model, he also came to, um, to do a deep ongoing transformational work in us by the power of his spirit working in us. And as we live our lives in intimate relationship with him and follow after him. <laughs> So that, so that our lives reflect more and more and more this true inner goodness that is characteristic of Christ himself or what we're calling the even better life. And we spent considerable time on this a couple weeks ago as we just kind of laid the foundation for this series. But the point... The point of verse 20 is basically Jesus saying the pathway, the pathway to this life of true inner goodness is not an outside in pathway. It's not achieved by rigid rule keeping because rigid rule keeping um, almost always results in a search for loopholes <laughs> and kind of, you know, finding a way to do an end around, right? And so Jesus says, no, 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 this is not about rigid rule keeping. It's not an outside in pathway to becoming the people God's intends for us to be become. It's an inside out pathway that comes as we walk in relationship with Jesus and as he does his work of forming a kingdom heart in us. 
And by kingdom heart, we mean that a heart that reflects the values, a heart that reflects the priorities of the kingdom of heaven. And he desires to form that kind of a heart in us. So I say all that to say Jesus is not giving us new rules here. This is really important to understand as we study this passage of scripture. Jesus is not giving us new rules. He's not like sharpening his pencil and pencil and more narrowly defining the rules. Actually, he's doing just the opposite. He's enlarging it so that this encompasses our whole heart and our whole life. That it's all encompassing. Remember, maybe the, the quote from a couple of weeks ago, um, what is presented in this passage is not a new law, but a new way. Not a new law, but a new way. So these are not new rules, but rather Jesus is giving us examples. He's giving us illustrations. He's giving us insights into what a a life that is expressed out of a kingdom heart looks like. What does a heart, what does a life that's expressed out of a kingdom heart look like? And in Matthew chapter 5 verse 21, we read these words. You have heard it said, said Jesus, to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Where did they hear that? They heard it from the law of Moses, right? They heard it from like the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder. And, and that's good, is it? That's good. That's a good law. I like that one. Um, and it's not good because I like it. I like it because it's, it's good. It's good for us. Um, it, that law helps lead us to the good life, you know, for everyone involved. It's good, it's good for the would-be murderer. It's good for the would-be murdered. It's good for the society at large. Don't murder. That's a good law, and it leads to the good life. However, Jesus said, and I'm paraphrasing heavily here, but he said, don't, don't just follow the letter of the law. Because just following the letter of the law is not good enough. It's, we can do better. We can do better. Just simply, simply following the letter of the law, simply do not murder, though it's a good law and it's good for everybody. It's a pretty low bar, right? Um, it, it doesn't really address the heart of God. It doesn't really, just keeping the rule, do not murder, doesn't, it, it doesn't really capture what God was intending. I mean, it keeps us from murdering each other, maybe, maybe not, but it doesn't deal with the, the, the issues of the heart that lead us in the direction of murder, you see, laws, laws cannot deal with the heart issues, right? You've heard it said we can't legislate righteousness. I mean, we can make good laws and we can put good laws into, pl- into place, but we can't legislate what happens in a person's heart. And we can't legislate righteousness. So laws only deal with behavior. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 we've got, we've got to deal with so much more. We've got to deal with the real issues of the human heart, And so Jesus says this, you have heard it said, don't murder, but I tell you that anyone who's angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And so he he says, let's let's not just just talk about murder. (laughs) Let's not just talk about the thing. Let's talk about the thing that leads to the thing. (laughs) Let's talk about what motivates us, what leads us in the direction of murder. We're told um, that there are two common Greek words in the New Testament that are translated anger. Uh, One is thumos and the other is orge. That word is not orgy. That was last week. But um, so so this thumos and orge. uh, Thumos is an anger that flares up and dies down quickly. It's like setting dry straw on fire it's like you know when you like have a real Christmas tree and the most fun thing about a real Christmas tree is after Christmas when you take it outside and you set it on fire and it goes you know that's like that right 
That's thumos. It flares up, dies down quickly. Orge is, is more of a slow burn. It's more of a, an intentionally stoked and nurtured fire. And that's the word that Jesus uses here. We, we all get angry, right? Anybody not ever get angry? You just lie. Um, so, um, but, so we, we all get angry. It's a very natural response. It's a built-in, you know, human, physiological, and, and emotional response. And, and anger itself is not a sin. We talked about this not too long ago, spent a little time on this. But anger in and of itself is not a sin, although... It can very easily lead to sin, and we don't need the Bible to tell us that. We know that, right? Which is why, you know, Jesus and, and like the Apostle Paul in the New Testament teaches us to put away anger as much as possible, to put away anger. And Paul says, in your anger, recognizing that, you know, anger happens, but in your anger, Paul says, do not Sin. So anger in and of itself is not sin, but in your anger, Paul says, do not sin. But Jesus, Jesus says here, this slow burning, brooding, intentionally stoked fire toward someone, Jesus says, we've got to deal with that. We've got to deal with that because that is not leading to a good place. It's not leading to the ways of life. It's not, it's not leading to the life of true inner goodness. It's not leading to the even better life. And then Jesus takes a second step and a third step kind of underneath the surface in dealing with the issues of our heart. And he says, he says again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Racha, is answerable to the court, and anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Actually, um, the word Jesus uses there that's translated hell is the word Gehenna, um, which was literally, it was like the garbage dump outside of the city of Jerusalem that continually smoldered and burned and stunk. And over time, Gehenna became the word that represented the reality of hell, the, the absence of the life-giving presence of God. And Jesus is saying, your life is in danger of becoming a Gehenna. We're told... We're told that the word racha is an untranslatable word that's perhaps more of a sound uh, than it is a word that, that perhaps, and the, the biblical scholars that I read said perhaps it came from the sound of uh, someone clearing their throat. <laughs> like racha. Try it. See if you spit on somebody near you. Okay, go ahead and uh, give it a shot. Racha. So, um, so it was intended, uh, just by the sound of it, it was intended to be a very demeaning, degrading, derogatory term, like something gross that you hawk up and spit out. But that was the point. Um, racha. And then the words, you fool, were told simply don't carry the weight in our modern English vernacular that they did in the ancient Greek. There's something lost in translation here. The, the English equivalent would have to be something way more contemptible than the words you fool in English. It would have to be something way more crude, way more vile. And I'll just let you fill in your own blanks. I won't give you suggestions on that one, okay? But guys... This is so important. This is, not, this is not a rule against saying certain words. Although there are words that are not in any way helpful to be found in the vocabulary, especially of a Christian person. <laughs> but this, this is not a rule against saying certain words because all that does is motivate us to find different words, right? <laughs> Oh, that's on the don't say list, but this is not on the don't say list, so I can't say that, but I can say this. So it just motivates us to find different words, but what Jesus is addressing here is the attitude behind the words. 
Dallas Willard writes, um, when we trace wrongdoing back to its roots in the human heart, we find that in the overwhelming number of cases, it involves some form of anger. And close beside anger, you will find its twin brother, contempt. We know what contempt is, right? One definition is the feeling that a person or thing is beneath consideration, worthless or deserving of scorn. That's contempt. Willard writes, uh, the primary function of anger in life is to alert me to an obstruction to my will and immediately raise an alarm and resistance, even before I have time to think about it. And we know that's true, right? All of a sudden, we just discover, wow, that really made me angry. I didn't even have time to think about it. It just happened, right? (laughs) And so even before we think about it, but he goes on to say that the anger that is a reality among us is much more than this and quickly turns into something that is inherently evil. He says we can and usually do choose to be angry. Anger arises spontaneously, but we can actively receive it and decide to indulge it, and we usually do, he says. We may even become an angry person. Think, think Gehenna. Think our life becoming the smoldering, stinky garbage dump of Gehenna. And any incident, he says, can evoke from us a torrent of rage. Somebody cuts us off on the highway and it evokes a torrent of rage because our lives have just become consumed by this anger. One more thing from Dallas Willard. Anger, he says, anger indulged instead of simply waved off always has in it an element of self-righteousness and vanity. Find a person who has embraced anger and you find a person with a wounded ego. So what do we do? You know, if we're not gonna if we're not gonna indulge our anger and nurture an attitude of contempt, what do we do? Well, Jesus goes on to give a couple of illustrations, and that's what these are. There are a couple of illustrations in the next few verses of what relinquishing our anger and our contempt and having a kingdom heart formed in us. Jesus gives some examples of what this could look like. And of course, he gives a couple of examples out of his world, out of his first century ancient Jewish context, right? And so we have to kind of do the work of, well, what's that mean for us? And Dr. N.T. Wright says, Of these verses, these illustrations that Jesus gives, he says, Jesus offers two remarkably specific and practical commands. Be reconciled and make friends. (laughs) Be reconciled and make friends. Look at it with me, if you would, verses 23 and following. Just for fun, we're going to read that from the message. If, you know, if you don't know the message, uh, probably, what, 20 years ago, something like that. Eugene Peterson, a Presbyterian pastor and, new, and biblical scholar, he took upon himself to do this uh, very faithful, but it's an English uh, paraphrase of the scripture called the message. And let's, let's look at it in verses 23 and 24. This this is, how, this is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter your place of worship and about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you, abandon your offering, leave immediately, go to this friend and make things right, then and only then come back and work things out with God. I said a couple weeks ago that Jesus is all about relationships. I mean, that's, that's his thing, right? He's all about relationships. And he's, uh, he's about this vertical relationship, our relationship with God. In fact, that's why he came, right? To restore 
this, to reconcile this broken relationship between humanity and, and God. <laughs> and he's not just concerned about the, the vertical relationship. He's concerned about the horizontal relationships in our lives, our relationships with one another. In fact, that's why he came, right? <laughs> He came as an example to show us what it looks like to be truly human and how to live in relationship with one another. But he didn't just come to be an example. He also came that we, he might empower us as his people to live out this life of loving each other well. In fact, um, are you aware of what Jesus said that one day when, when someone came to him, one of the religious leaders came to him and they said, Jesus, of all the law and the prophets, of everything, you know, all the voices that have spoken into our lives, of all the law and the prophets, what's the most important command? And you know what he said? Love the Lord your God with all your whole being, every part of it, with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. He said that's the first and greatest command, of it, but he didn't stop there, right? He immediately said, but the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so Jesus is saying both of these, the vertical and the horizontal, they're both really, really, really important and there's a sense in which they're, they're, kind, of, they're kind of the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I, they're, at least they're, very, they're two sides of the same coin. You just can't bifurcate them. You can't separate them. They're, they're kind of the same thing. To love God in so many ways is to love people, and to love people in so many ways is to love God. <laughs> and so as an illustration... Jesus picks this really, really, really super holy moment in the life of an ancient Jew. It's the moment of a Jewish person going into the temple to offer a sacrifice of worship to the Lord. And I mean, as far as big deals go, this was one of them, right? This was a big deal. This was, a, this was serious business. And Jesus says... Jesus says, even if you're in that moment of offering a sacrifice of worship to the Lord, even if you're in that moment and there you remember that your friend has a grudge against you. And notice the words. He doesn't even say there you remember that you have a grudge against your friend. He says you remember that your friend has a grudge against you. I mean, this isn't even your grudge. It's their grudge. But Jesus says, it doesn't matter whose grudge it is. What's ma what matters is that there's a broken relationship that needs to be restored. And Jesus says these staggeringly important words. The relationship is even more important in that moment than the practice of your religious ritual. Even as important as the practice of religious ritual is, was and is, Jesus says, no, no, no. <laughs> In that moment, there's something that's prior. So first go and be reconciled to your brother. First go and be reconciled to your sister. Then come and offer your worship. And guys, this is not a new rule, all right? This is not a new rule. This doesn't mean that you have to stay away from church till you get all your relationships ironed out, right? That's not what it, Jesus is saying. He's not saying don't show up for church till you get everything settled. That's not what he's saying. In fact, sometimes it's like in this context of the church gathered for worship, sometimes this is the context in which Jesus speaks to our hearts really clearly and points out issues that we need to get ironed out with people, right? But what Jesus is doing is painting a portrait of a kingdom heart. What Jesus is doing is he's saying this is, this is what a heart that loves and values and seeks to live at peace with people, all the people of our lives. This is a kingdom heart. This is what it looks like. And Jesus says loving people trumps even the practice of religious ritual. 
And then he says, um, or say you're out on the street and an old enemy accosts you. Don't lose a minute. Make the first move. Make things right with him. After all, if you leave the first move to him, knowing his track record, you'll likely end up in court, maybe even in jail. And if that happens, you won't get out without a stiff fine. Second principle. According to N.T. Wright, the first is be reconciled. The second is make friends. Make friends. Instead of getting all eaten up with bitterness, instead of getting all eaten up with a need for revenge, instead of getting all eaten up with a desire for greed or whatever it might be, instead of that, seek to make friends. What's it say in Romans chapter 12, verse 18? I'm glad you asked. Let's read it together aloud, okay? Uh, Can we dim the lights for a second so we can see this? All right, can you see it? Let's read it aloud together. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all people. I think you can do better. Let's try it one more time. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all people. By the way, the storm apparently jacked with our... uh, projector here in the middle so uh, that's why it's not on if possible as far as it depends on who you live at peace with all people so be reconciled and make friends I led um, with a question earlier when was the last time you were really angry Um, You can bring those lights back up a little bit if you want. I like to see their angry faces. Um, So when was the last time you were really angry? This isn't isn't like probably the last time for me, but it's a time that came to mind. So um, several years ago, by the way, the band's going to come and help us wrap up here in a second. So we're going to land the plane, all right? Several years ago when our son Ben was a senior in high school, he was, he was on the Spring Hill Broncos, you know, high school basketball team. And I, I, keywords, he was on the team. He never played, uh, but, but he, was, he was on the team. And of course, you know, as a parent, right, um, as, a, as a parent, it frustrated the life out of me that Ben never got to play. And, but, you know, you know how parents are, right? So, protective and all that so it frustrated me to death and and uh, truthfully I think truthfully in, in part it frustrated me because I mean I'm I'm not a great basketball player and anybody a lot of people can testify to that but I love the game of basketball and always have and I still play some uh, and I at least I know the game well enough to know that Ben was actually a decent player he wasn't like terrible if he I mean if he would have sucked, I would have encouraged him to take up, you know, violin or whatever. But, um, but he, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't a bad basketball player. He just, he just didn't get to play. So, um, and, and though I was frustrated, I mostly, mostly held my emotions in check most of the time. And, and I mostly held my tongue in check most of the time till one night. Um, senior night. And there were, there were five seniors um, on the basketball team that year. And if you know anything about basketball, you know there are five positions, uh, you know, that, that play at a time in the game of basketball. And, and Ben was so excited, you know, because most, most programs, even if your seniors aren't your starters, it's senior night. So you start your seniors, at least give them a little taste, you know. And, and so he was so excited that maybe, maybe this was his one night, you know, to start and but it didn't happen and not only not only did coach not start all five of his seniors who were on the team but he left Ben sitting on the bench the entire game until the game was well in hand or or well out of hand I actually can't remember uh, one way or the other but but he left him sitting on the bench the entire game till there were like 30 seconds left and then he's like ah well (laughs) And talk about angry. 
I'm not talking about Ben. I'm talking about his dad. I was just so angry. And, and I did something, uh, thankfully, that's very out of character for me. I'm, I'm thankful that this is generally out of character for me. But I was just so angry. I didn't know what to do with myself. And I met the coach in the hallway immediately after the game, you know, like on their way back to the locker room. I met him immediately in the hallway, and I said, can I talk to you for a minute? <laughs> and I think he could tell by the look in my eyes this was not going to be a pleasant conversation. But to his credit, <laughs> to his credit, he said, wait here for a moment. I'll be back. You know, he had to go deal with first things first, go talk to his team in the locker room, all that stuff. But after, after a few minutes, he came back. And, and uh, I, I, I just unloaded <laughs> on him a little bit. I mean, I wasn't screaming. I wasn't cursing. But I just said that was one of the most classless moves I've ever seen anybody make. And I kind of let him have it and, and we went our separate ways. And I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if I sinned in my anger or not. I, probably at least in my heart <laughs> I did. But, but I do know this. We were not reconciled and we were not friends <laughs> after that conversation took place. And, and the truth is I, I wasn't really interested in being either one of those. <laughs> reconciled or friends in that moment but before long after I got home God began to move in really close to my heart as God sometimes does and he began to whisper some things in the deep places of my heart and the whisper of God went something like this so, so what are you going to do now Are you just going to hold on to this? You're going to just you're going to you're going to nurture this fire. You're going to kindle this flame in your heart. You're going to you're going to let your heart just get filled up with contempt toward the coach. Maybe trash his name, you know, anytime you get a chance. And my answer to God was, uh, yes, <laughs> no. And God whispered, um, you know what you need to do, right? And I said, no, yes. So on Monday, this happened on Friday night, and on Monday morning, I called the school, and I called, made an appointment with the coach, and, and he graciously said yes to an appointment with me. And, and so I went in, I met with him, and I said, man, I owe you an apology. I said, you and I have very different coaching philosophies, and I strongly disagree with what you did on Friday night. But I owe you an apology. I apologize for my response. It wasn't the time. It wasn't the place. It wasn't the spirit with which to have that conversation. And I apologize. And he said, uh, he said, you know what, I, I've been coaching a long time. And he had. He'd been coaching a long time. He said, I've been coaching a long time, and you're the first parent that's ever come in and apologized for anything. <laughs> so thank you for your apology. I accept it. And I don't say that to make me the hero of the story because I'm absolutely not. I owed him an apology. And God is the great hero of the story. And guess what? That day, two things happened. We were reconciled. And we kind of became friends. I mean, we didn't like hang out or anything, but... But we didn't have to avoid each other when we saw each other. We didn't have to pretend we didn't see each other. Didn't have to hide in the grocery store if I saw them on the other aisle. No. Guys, um, that's the even better life into which Jesus invites us. 
And it's not. It's not about rigidly keeping rules and looking for loopholes. It's about Christ forming a kingdom heart in us. And particularly in this case, it's about letting go of our anger. And it's about letting go of our contempt. And it's about learning to love each other well by Christ's power that is at work within us. So what about you? Is there some anger? Is there perhaps some attitude of contempt that you need to let go of? With God's help. And and next step, is there some reconciliation, even if it's not your grudge? (laughs) Is there some reconciliation you need to pursue? Is is there an enemy that you need to begin to treat as a friend? Father, help us. We really need your help.